Um, so Lisa Moore is up next, my friend and colleague and mentor in the English department at UT, um, a celebrated scholar of 18th century British literature and queer studies, and a wonderful poet. Um, she writes playful, inventive, assertive poems that make their case with insistence and grace and relentless optimism, which are all qualities that I cherish in Lisa herself. Um, she has a gem-like chapbook that you should all purchase. Um, mm -hmm. It's called 24 Hours of Men. Uh, for the gay men in the room, it's a spoiler that that title may not mean what you would like it to mean. <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out that Lisa's version of 24 Hours of Men is even better. Um, so, as you can see for yourself right now. So, Lisa Moore. <laughs> I'm finding myself so moved to be here. I guess I'm echoing what Sequoia said. Um, and, and Sequoia's remarks just reminded me of um, really when I first encountered Chad, which was reading his application for a postdoctoral fellowship in the English department probably 10 years ago or something. And I have to say that reading his description of his book what was going to be his book, Word of Mouth, I kind of fell in love with him a little bit. And then I, um, somehow we had some email. Uh, he was writing about gossip. I had a little piece from my book, Sister Arts, that was about gossip. We exchanged a little bit of work. And pretty soon I just felt like I, um, this was, that Chad was the friend and interlocutor I really needed. and. Somehow, by hook or by crook, uh, I lucked out and Chad came here for what was supposed to be two years and then it got extended by one year and then it got extended by six years and then he got tenure! <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm just happy and grateful every time I think about it that um, I get to be friends with Chad. Um, he's also such a generous reader of other people's work and you can tell by the incredible comments he's making about um, about other poets tonight. Again, you know, generous, insightful. He can really uh, tell you your name uh, in a way that I think is part of the reason that make, that he's such a, a, a beloved teacher as well. So um, it's hard to follow Sequoia. I'm such a fan of Sequoia's um, poetry, and and mine are in a, a little bit more of a sassy vein. So. <laughs> um, I'll start with this one called Plato's Right. Yesterday I came back home again, another work trip. Gold, you kept the home fires burning. Yearning, there was some while I was gone, but it's the end of Sunday dinner, full with cousins come to visit. So we just exchange a thumbs up, sweet kiss, warm hug. You used to bend me backwards over couches in your ardor. With kids and in-laws, aches and pains, it's harder to dance that dance. I miss it, but I'm glad we had it. Jeweled years alone and mad about each other's bodies. Plato's right. Lust leads us on. Remember, Jem, that night, our first? You asked me why we're here. I answered, divine love. That's also why we're queer. <laughs> Um, this is uh, the one poem I'll read tonight that is from my chat book that uh, Chad generously mentioned. Uh, the title is Poem I Wrote Instead of Listing the Names of Every Boy and Man Who Has Assaulted or Harassed Me. I need a poem like an ice pick. Like an ice pick needs a fish, a nice slithery target below the thick frozen layer holding its dead sticks. I wear outrage like a hair shirt, scary and close to the skin, prickles covering the zipper down the back, which I can't reach anyway. Everyone knew, including you. Some kept secrets, others spoke up, and these were identical gestures in that they changed nothing. When the ice melts, it releases the thousand-year diseases. And those might kill us before the living water sets us free. I need a poem like a neutron bomb, flooding cells on a mitochondrial level, lighting up neural pathways and epidural channels, 
bloom after bloom, touching everything. <laughs> um, I'm glad you liked that one. This one, I don't know, may get me canceled. I don't know. <laughs> um, this is, as you know, um, we continue to be dealing with Title IX investigations, uh, investigations about sexual harassment on the part of professors at the University of Texas, and um, this is just a, a daily hardship and struggle, especially for those of us, and I see some of us around the room who uh, really end up having to do the cleanup work of all the damage that is done and um, the repair work that's needed to try to keep um, I keep uh, the campus a place where people can do some teaching and learning. Um, and I often find myself in uh, weird equivocal positions where um, uh, I'm kind of not really satisfying anybody with my take on the situation. Um, so that's true about one of the cases that's going on uh, at UT where um, you know, a very unpopular professor but uh, who does research in queer studies on uh, ancient Greek pederasty, who has not been found in violation of the sexual misconduct policy, <laughs> but is nonetheless difficult in many ways, is, um, is somebody who was on my mind a lot. Uh, his house was broken into, um, and uh, he had to leave town. Professor accused of promoting child rape. I reach into time up to my elbows part the darkness to peer back to the first time I heard the word queer. Heard from a teenage boy that he hated homosexuals because they molested children, and he knew because it had happened to him. I saw myself in that story as the homosexual, not the molested child, although I was a molested child and not yet a homosexual. I had read about a small, brave mouse named Reapy Cheap, a name I later gave my son in utero. My courage was high-pitched, my rapier needle-sharp, invisible, almost risible, my dignity fragile as glass. I said I didn't think they were all like that. Remembering this now, I fear my quick allegiance to the queerest of the queer. My arms windmill as I tip on the edge of an abyss that fierceness seems to help me not to fear. The advice I hear, you will be canceled. He's not worth it. Now is not the time. Which of these truths is betrayal? Which is mine? That's the first time I've read that one out loud. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's lighten it up. I have a couple of, uh, yeah. Uh, these are my last two, and they're kind of Ars Poetica. This one's untitled. My theory is there are two kinds of people, gravity and levity. I've never been an old woman, wrinkled, beautiful, wholesome as a dried apple, but I want to be. A poem is a place where ghosts stay ghosts, patterns say boo. I joy, Red Stella, Austin tattoo, poem written by driving down North Lamar, remembering you. I spent the whole weekend in meditation, my eyes glued shut by ragweed pollen. <laughs> This last one is actually one that I wrote at the beginning, sort of 2016-ish, the beginning of uh, the you know, upsurge in what we're calling now the Me Too movement, um, when there was a lot of talk about, um, yeah, this is a witch hunt. And I was like, I think it is a witch hunt, but the witches are doing the hunting this time. That's the difference. <laughs> so it's called Cackle. Bring back the cackle. The sharp, broken cry of a hen after laying. Harsh laughter that gets to the root of the matter. The witch is a rackle woman, strong-headed, strong-boned, her laughter as bone broth for raised hackles. 
The cackle is catching. My giggles ripple. Clap back for the curves of the body, the folds of the belly, moving with gravity. The outward and downward curve of the thighs left over from that last baby. Adore the enormous belly of the mannish mother. Bring back the cackle, nursemaid of pain-free sleep. Cackle as action, cackle as proper name. Mutter kisses into mud. Between your hips is a twinned crystal. Reach for that mackle and rise, riding your broomstick of light. You won't fall if you don't look down. <laughs>